And then in 1973, uh, the first national environmental conference of the PRC took place. In uh, 1974, we see the erection of the first leadership small group, uh, Lingdao Xiaozu, of the State Council for Environmental Protection. The function of this LSG was to coordinate environmental protection activities, and uh, nevertheless, it had only little impact uh, due to its uh, low administrative rank. Then, in 74, the so called Three Waste Bureau, San Fei, had been uh, erected. These were administrative um, basic units to implement the first environmental standards of the PRC. So you want to know, of course, right now, what are these three wastes? The first is air pollution, the second water pollution, and the third industrial waste. So these, uh, th this uh, three waste system, as I just told you, traces back to the first national environmental standard of the same year, uh, which these bureaus had to control. And then uh, the next important year is 1978, when the environmental protection has been written in the, um, into the third, or if you count it in another way, into the fourth constitution, also called Chiba uh, Sienfo. And this reads, the state protects the environment and the natural resources and prevents pollution and other public nuisance. So, yes, this is a very important year since um, the environmental protection issue had been written in the Chinese constitution. So in the, what is called in Chinese, the mother of all law, the MUFA, and <coughs> So it was a very important year. So right now I would like to tell you something about the situation after 79. This is also called, or what I called here, the Deng Jianghu era. So the era of first Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and of Hu Jintao. So the first and very important year was the year of 79 when the environmental protection law, the EPL, Huan Jingbao Hu Fa had been issued. This is something like um, Häuser, this is something like a basic law of the Chinese environmental law body. So we can call it a Grundgesetz. Häuser calls it um, Umweltschutzbasisgesetz. Um, other authors uh, think that it's more accurate to think of it as something like a general part of the environmental pollution prevention and control regime, because the main issue of this law is pollution. But you can, of course, also call it basic law. This is just a term of, um, a thing of naming it. Uh, very important is that it was only promulgated as a draft law. Draft law. So, for for trial implementation, shixing in Chinese, and that meant that it was subject to repeal. So it could be repealed every time. And why was it only issued as a as a draft law? Because at that time, the Chinese legislator was not very um, experienced with issuing laws. So it was something like an untried law, and they want to see how it works. If it works, they can, they can um, if it don't work, they can issue a new law. If it works, then it's okay. And so it was some time of experience, experiencing. This is, by the way, also typical for today's China, and this experiencing with legal issues still works today. So we can say, as uh, Richard Ferris and Chang Hongjun uh, call it, say it that this, um, this for trial implementation can also be translated to with the synonym of interim or temporarily, because this law was legally valid, but it was only on a trial basis. And then finally, 10 years later, we see the promulgation of a normal law, so no more on a trial basis. So right now I would like to show you the structure of this law. And here, first of all, you have a general provisions chapter. This is uh, something which is, which is uh, normal with respect to laws. We also have the same in German law, right? And in the second chapter, we have supervision and management of the environment. In the third chapter, protection and improvement of the environment. 
Fourth chapter, prevention and control of environmental pollution and other public hazards. Chapter five, this is also a typical chapter for environmental laws in China. You have a legal liabilities chapter. So if you, <clears throat> if you want to know more about this chapter, you can um, also watch my other video on YouTube about the legal liabilities in environmental law. And yeah, so chapter six, are supplementary provisions. This is also typically for laws in general. In German, we have these Übergangsbestimmungen, Schlussbestimmungen, or similar um, chapter titles. Okay, right now I cannot go into detail about this law. I just want to show you the key principles in this law. So, first, for instance, we can find a stipulation about the possibility of reporting and filing charges, Article 6 or the possibility of setting local pollutant discharge standards. So the setting of standards is of course very important. Then pollution causing facilities must observe environmental laws. Polluters are required to eliminate and control pollution within a certain time. So this issue of, um, of the polluter pays principle of course. And then if that fails, the possibility to ban polluting units. Okay, so these are the key principles that um, Richard Ferris and Chang Hongqun, one of the, a few of the key principles uh, that Richard Ferris and Chang Hongqun uh, state in their article. So right now I want to show you some law groups. So there's a distinction between certain kinds of laws in, in, in the environmental legal regime in China. We first have what I called, or what is called by Häuser, so-called environmental basic laws. So, for instance, this EPL, or also the Environmental Impact Assessment Law, issued only in 2003, 2003. So you cannot find this law in this book, unfortunately, because this book has been written in 2001 only. But if you want to know more about this law, I will also tell you later more about that. You just can read the law, it's only around 10 pages long, so it's not so complicated, actually. So then the second group are so-called anti-pollution laws, as Stephanie Byer says in her article, <coughs> or also called them emission control laws, Emissionsschutzgesetze. So for instance, the air pollution prevention and control law, or the environmental noise pollution control law, so you can find more of these uh, examples in the respective literature, of course. But I just want to show you the next group, and this group are the natural resources conservation laws, Ressourcenschutzgesetze. So this is, for example, the water laws, the Schulfa, or the forestry laws. So these are natural resources which are protected by the law. Then. The fourth big group is the criminal law, of course. So, for instance, the criminal code, SGB Xingfa, in Chinese, and or for instance, the administrative criminal law, Verwaltungs, <coughs> so the aspect of Verwaltungsstrafrecht. So there had been a major reform in 1997 when the criminal code has been reformed, and there was input in own section of environmental protection law into the criminal law. So at that time the environmental uh, criminal law became what is called core criminal law, Kerstrafrecht Hölzchen-Sinfa. And um, yes, this is also an issue in w about which I will talk in another video, in the video about legal liabilities. So you can watch it and learn more if you want. Then in the last category, uh,